ASOS had run out of money. Nick, the founder, sold his car to pay the staff payroll. It was everything about keeping ASOS alive. Nick Baton, former CEO of ASOS and Matches Passion. He's here to show you what it takes for a CEO to grow a company from 200 million to 4 billion. What has been the main reason for this success? We had an amazing team who were super passionate about what they were doing. We were being super disruptive. We were focused on winning. I never grew up wanting to be an accountant. I went into it going, I can do it. I love the way it trained my brain. Always be authentic, brave, creative, and disciplined. Don't pretend you know. If you pretend you know, you'll get it wrong. I was super emotional about ASOS because I was in love with it. What do you think everyone at e-commerce needs to know about e-commerce? So first of all, Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, career coach, and host of the show. Here we talk about how to find career fulfillment, how to succeed in business, and how to live well whilst doing so. Very quickly, I really need your help. We have entered the podcast awards, and then listener's choice is now open for voting. You can directly support our show by voting for us. Just click the link in the show notes, look up Anatomy of a Leader, and get voting. I promise you, I will not let you down. Thank you so much. Nick, hey. welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Lovely to be here, Mary. Nice to meet you. And you. Well, before we get started talking about your time as CEO at ASOS, and I have to know, where did you get your tan? Oh, uh, crikey. Uh, so coming out of matches, um, I've uh, done an awful lot of uh, yoga and an awful lot of golf. And fortunately, over the last few weeks, it's been good weather. So <laughs> I seem to have that skin. You must that, tan very well. Yeah, well, for blonde hair, blue eyes, I don't know where it comes from. But yes, <laughs> I definitely tan well. Yeah, you look like you've been surfing, like for the summer. I mean, uh, for the story, I could say I have, but I haven't. <laughs> uh, so I've just been out and about in the garden, out and about on my bike, out and about playing golf. So. That sounds very healthy lifestyle is that something that you've always maintained in your life yeah always try to keep a little bit of balance uh, it kind of puts my brain back together and so being on a bike doing a bit of yoga doing a bit of golf uh, I found yoga uh, late it puts my brain back together mm -hmm. and so it's not the only thing I do but it's one of the things that keeps me focused keeps me centered and if on my bike I can't think about anything else because I'll fall off yeah you have so, to concentrate so it makes it helps me switch off yeah now, I'm really glad you say that because I know I meet a lot of people who really discover taking care of their brain and their bodies quite late in their kind of business career and it's something that they feel like they have to play catch up to do but it makes such a massive difference to your ability to perform on the job 100% so there's a couple of the phrase I always use is be active on active off, uh, active off and if active off is reading a book uh, doing some painting or just hanging out with the family or your friends do that um, but it doesn't have to be sport because not everyone wants to do sport do yoga do cycling do golf but just find something to be active off because that keeps everything in balance mm -hmm. and it's best to know wherever your um, power source is and if your power source is your friends and family go back to that to rejuvenate your power source if they don't want to hang out with you that particular moment go and read a book read the paper switch off so be active on be active off is what I've always tried to do mm. but I mean I didn't get that in my 20s because when you're in your 20s you think you're invincible so you just run hard and keep running hard and then you realize you're burning yourself out so you've got to find a different mechanism mm. so at which point did you realize that you can't maintain that sort of relentless hustle kind of style when you look yourself in the mirror and you've got um, uh, bags under your eyes and you're genuinely uh, tired and you're not focusing on the things you want to focus on and you're being ratty around the people that um, you are close to. Um, so it's probably my early 30s while I realised it, when I was bringing back issues and being ratty with my wife, ratty with my friends and family. I'm like, I need to... I need to find a different mechanism. I've got to keep keep something in check. I can't perform 100, 100 miles an hour without putting something back. So it was round about my 30s, I understood that. Mm. So you kind of only learned the hard way. Yeah, totally. Mm. I mean, the, the, there's often things that you uh, you tell people, but um, the things you mostly tell people are through experience rather than things you've done. And so uh, I developed a meditation type technique. Now, if anyone's listening who is proper into meditation, they will 
they will scream at this. But I know now when it's time for me to decompress. Um, and it came at me when I was, um, when I was at Matalan years ago. I was uh, put in charge of technology, CIO. I was totally equipped for that. And there was one moment where all the tills weren't working, the warehouse wasn't working, and it was all to do with the technology. And so I was getting screamed at by the CEO, screamed at by the, by the founder. And I'm like, I just don't know what's going wrong here. So I went to speak to the IT guys. They came over and explained what had happened. And they used a phrase going, the database has been congested, Nick. We've got a number of database locks, locks uh, and we need to go through a defragmentation process. So I had to kind of say, you have to explain what that means. Talk to me like I'm five, because I have no idea what you've just said. And then the IT guy rolled his eyes and went, here's another guy in charge of IT who doesn't understand IT. And he was right. And he said, well, you're old enough to remember a telephone directory, aren't you, Nick? I said, yes, I am. And he said, imagine pulling out every page of the telephone directory and then putting it all back together in a non-chronological order. I went, yeah. He said, that's what happens with a database. And I went, how's it get that way? He said, keep hitting the same records. It gets fragmented. It needs re-indexing and refragmenting. I went, brilliant. And as he walked away, I went, that's what happened to my brain. So I kind of developed a my own mental defrag process mm -hmm. where it was like I keep hitting the same files in my brain I suddenly get um, a little bit foggy get a little bit ratty less clear so I kind of go into a meditative process where I'm going what am I going to leave behind what's not making me stronger what do I need to take forward and I found if I ask myself those questions get out of the way do a little bit of active off um, the answers come to me and the things that were bothering me and slowing me down often the things that I can't control or won't happen and they're the ones that are also waking me up in the middle of the night mm -hmm. so I go into that process every three months or so so I caught my own mental defrag which I credit to that IT guy who was <laughs> rolling his eyes speaking to me many years ago when I was at Matalan. Mm. I love this idea of figuring out in your through experience like where at which point you get to this sort of frazzled state where your brain is literally like scrambled and then learning that and being able to like spot the signs and then be able to say you know what I'm dealing with this situation that I need to then kind of like unwind myself from it yeah definitely I mean mm -hmm. so it it was it came at me through experience through trial and error through actually going I've got to sort something out here mm -hmm. so it certainly wasn't something that I planned to do it was something I developed and went right that's good mm -hmm. many years later when I was CEO of ASOS um, I moved it on again, um, and the same process. I met a guy called Kieran Bracken, who was chief exec at Logica at the time. He and I did a panel, and I've stole shamelessly this story from him and this process from him. And I don't do it quite as, as religiously as he does, but he talks about firing himself every year. And so this is a CEO, so he goes, I'm going to fire myself every year. And then I'm going to rehire myself the following week. And I'm going to be rehired by the very person who, um, who knows everything about me, everything um, that I've been doing well, everything that I've not done, and everything that uh, I need to do. And that person is me. And so he then talks about what do you say to yourself to rehire yourself to go again and be fit for running the organisation. And I love that. Mm. that's kind of like you can't hide from yourself and so uh, I've done that a few times and um, so that's quite a good process too mm. it just kind of shreds the things that um, that are, are not helping you and actually goes right this is what I need to do I'm rehired and I personally feel it quite energizing mm, it's like shedding your what's not serving you anymore correct and then being very intentional about what you're going to bring back in correct so it's like what you know what does, doesn't need to be here like go away and let's focus on what the bigger picture here is clear the mental pride yeah. clear your mental processes refocus on what's important mm -hmm. so really good process so I'm sure many people have some similar processes because it, it builds your own resilience it builds your own focus and it's very difficult to, um, to uh, say, this is how you should do it. It's just a, this is a process that works for certain people. If you do something similar, I think it's important that you will find your own process. Mm. Take me back to your early years. Where did you grow up? 
grew up in Nottingham um, okay. and uh, one of uh, one of an um, uh, all boy family um, and grew up in a council house in Nottinghamshire. Uh, my father was the first one to go to university in our in our house, um, which was a poly actually. Um, and everyone else in our family were coal miners or um, steel workers all the way back. I've done the, um, the uh, Ancestry.com all the way back to the 18th century. They're all coal miners or worked in mines and things like that. So, yeah, that was kind of where I grew up. Mm, and how did that shape you? Uh, tough. I knew you'd ask me that. <laughs> I don't really know. Um, so uh, it was apart from it was... You coped with what uh, you coped with. Um, you uh, got on with whatever you got on with. Um, there was a general feeling of hard work and endeavour. Um, and it was kind of like you don't get anything unless you put some effort in. So those were definitely um, feelings that I got. Um, my father passed away or died when I was nine. Um, and so then there was a different feeling in the house where it was, I probably ought to... Um, uh, take a bit more responsibility and I felt that many years later mm-hmm. felt like I was a bit more responsible and I felt like I had to live up to something uh, not really knowing what that thing is mm-hmm. but kind of had that feeling which where are you in the birth order of your siblings I'm the oldest so you are the oldest, oldest three boys and how old were you when your father passed away nine years old nine years old you said yeah how how did you feel then so, I mean, this is this is not how I'd advise people dealing with it. I've probably put it in a box and left it in a box. <laughs> yeah. For how long? Uh, probably forty-five years. Wow. <laughs> but so it's every now and then I peek in the box, and but most of the time I leave it in the box. So I know that's not how you should do it, but that's kind of how I've dealt with it. I feel like it's. A, I mean, it's a surviving coping mechanism especially when you're so young to like you need to get on with it because it could be so overwhelming they can just consume you so I think it's it's there for a reason that coping strategy is there for a reason yeah I feel like the box is there looking after me Mm -hmm. but I don't need to go and revisit it all the time yeah so so you were nine years old you know growing up in a family you know tough times you know having to what you said is what I really like what you said is work hard and endeavor so this idea of well if you're going to get anywhere you have to work for it and you have to be enterprising and you know there's nothing given to you yeah and you have to do something differently too correct always had that feeling Mm. it sent sent me on a different path that uh, my father did pass away um because um i don't think i will be um what i will be what i've achieved now without it so it meant that um, some people came to assist uh, my mum um, and then took me under their wing and gave me opportunities that I might not have had before. So, for example, there was one guy who kind of became a pseudo father figure for many years, said one um, said round about my A-levels time, um, said, um, why don't you come and work in my office um, during the summer? And that office was an accounting office. I'd never thought about doing accounting at all. Um, so after my A-levels, uh, which weren't great, they were very average, um, they, I joined the Royal Marines uh, and I signed up to be a Royal Marine. And he said, um, why don't you come and do some accounting? Now, you can't think of two things more polar opposite. <laughs> um, and so my mum wasn't massively keen on me signing up to be able to do Royal Marines. They were, they were active in Northern Ireland at the, that point in time, and she's from Northern Ireland, so she wasn't massively keen on that. Um, and so I, went, I tell you what, I'll go and do some, um, do some uh, work in the accounting office. And at that point in time, it was small traders, small businessmen, um, bringing in a bag of invoices and a few bank statements and going... Can you tell me how much money I've made? And so it literally was with a pencil and rubber on a extended trial balance working out how much money they'd made. I quite liked it. Um, but the, the thing that was most inspirational for me was looking at the people around me. So I'd be 18-ish when I was doing that. The people around me had all got good degrees. They'd all gone to a decent university. They'd got great air levels. I'd got none of that. Um, and I'm like, well... Why am I different to them? Well, I'm not different to them, apart from, actually, they have worked harder, got the butts um, in order, been to university. So I kind of went, well, I think I can do that. 
So after a period of time, um, they asked me whether I was interested. The same guy asked me if he was interested in doing it. I went, yeah, yeah, I can be an accountant. So I ditched the Royal Marines. Um, and they said, well, you have to go and do some more A-levels because your A-levels are terrible. I went, yeah, they are. So I did two more A-levels at night school. Then I went and did an accounting course at Trent Poly, which is the same poly my dad went to. Uh, Nottingham Trent University now. And uh, I then started the training contract at KPMG um, and Before became a chartered accountant. Into that, um, when you decided that you wanted to pursue this path and you've seen people who basically were role models and saying, well, I can, if they can do it, I can do it too. Was it easier then to study at A-levels and when you were doing, or did it still feel challenging like you had to push yourself yeah, it still felt challenging because mm. i was doing three nights a week at night school i did two a levels at night at night school did accounting and economics at night school mm. so i was working in the day and then three nights a week um uh, doing uh, doing at night school and then i and then i uh, and then um and i had other people help me as well so yeah it was challenging it felt like it's all i was doing um working and doing a levels mm. for a year mm. but it was worth it because it kind of like reset something and put me on a different path Mm. So then you said KPMG. Yep. Yeah. How was that? Loved it. Mm. Lots of young people, lots of bright people, different clients every week um, and different challenges. And what I love most about it is the way it trains your brain. And so it's a mental discipline, which suits me. Um, and I didn't know it suited me. It's how to think, how to analyze, how to diagnose different problems um, and a routine and process. And every week I was turning up, speaking to CEOs and CFOs, probably asking them about um, something low level about how can I match this invoice to a purchase order. But it was, you were meeting with other people that were who had achieved and were successful. And you tend to get the sense of the things you need to be doing. And I wanted to do those things too. Mm. So finance background, we're probably going to have to skip a lot because otherwise we're going to be here no, that's <laughs> for, fine. forever. But um, you you became the finance controller at Matalan. Yeah. So that kind of led you to there. What was your experience like there? Uh, so the very first week I um, uh, joined Matalan, um, I was given a task to do. I was head of business planning and finance. And they said, we want you to do a planning process, put together a five-year plan um, of how we link stock management, store management, store forecasts, uh, warehouse forecasts. I went, fine, I can do this. So I did all that. Um, and I socialized it with all the operating board. I was a member of the operating board. Uh, thought I'd nailed the presentation. Um, and the very first operating board, after I'd done it, which was just a month later, um, the, the presentation was an absolute car crash. And the CEO at the time, a chap called Angus Monroe, who is extremely numerate, capable guy, went, so that's really good, Nick. Um, and so what are we going to, how much are we going to take at Christmas? And this was round about October. I said, well, I don't know, Angus, um, because um, you asked me to do a long range plan. He said, yeah, but I'm really interested in what the Christmas sales plan was. And uh, then the whole meeting um, kind of turned and I suddenly felt very exposed going, sugar. I wish he'd asked me that because I hadn't done it. But what it taught me was that they'd had three days trading that uh, wasn't where they wanted it to be. And they were therefore worried about the near-term forecast. And I'd focus on the long term. So it was a really interesting lesson that in retail, you've got to be all over the details day to day. It works day to day and the day to day informs you. And so I walked out of that meeting, went to the CFO at the time and said, I'm really sorry I've let you down. Um, called the headhunter and went, I think you've put me in the wrong place. I need to leave. The headhunter talked me back around and said, don't be definite. These are the reasons why I want you to do it. There's a lesson in there for you. Went back to the CFO and, and said, I'm so sorry. And he went, I thought it was a really good meeting. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, the only thing that you missed was you weren't looking at the sales forecast day to day basis and standing in the shoes of the rest of the operating board, which I wasn't. So I never made that mistake again. And I became fascinated by retail, that there were things moving all the time. There's a machine turning 24-7. Someone's always buying something. Someone's always selling something. Something's always being fulfilled. There's always technology working. So it was a really good lesson early doors. Was that your first role in retail? 
Yes, it was. Okay. At KPMG, I did consulting, corporate finance and accounting, always retail clients. But that was my first time I'd actually been in retail. Mm. Well, in some ways also, because you haven't had that background, you know, you had to pretty much pick everything up when you were there. So it's it's not totally surprising that you would have missed something. Yeah, totally. I mean, the those guys I was working with were super established traders, merchandisers, marketing guys. Um, and you know, they, I was giving them something that I would do tomorrow. So the work was fine, but I just totally missed the fact I was not studying their shoes Mm -hmm. and they were all worried about the current trading and I was coming in going, this is where we're going. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up at ASOS? Um, I did a short time in a leisure business. So I've matched land seven years, did a short time in a hospitality, uh, leisure business. And then I met the current CFO at um, at a number at an accountant uh, dinner at Brockett Hall um, with uh, PwC, and I sat next to him, and I'd never heard of ASOS, and I had a lovely conversation with this guy, John Camerludin, and um, he apparently went back to the founder uh, who was also a Nick and said, "If you ever want me to do a different role, I've just met my replacement, which was me." Right. Now, I didn't know this. Some months later, I headhunter phoned me up and said, are you interested in um, ASOS? I went, well, I don't know anything about it, but I met this lovely guy a few months ago. He said they want to talk to you. So I went to meet the founder. Um, so I went to meet the HR director first, a lady called Andrea. Um, and it was a very small company. It was, there was probably, um, that time there was less than 200 million turnover, a couple hundred people in the office maximum. And the interview I had was uh, doubled up as a changing room. So while I was meeting the HR director, there was a screen behind me, and I became aware that people were getting undressed and getting and getting changed. And I said, just, what's going on there? Scrappy. <laughs> Scrappy. I said, uh, that's where the models change. And I'm, uh, so there was a screen in the room, and the models were changing behind me. Mm-hmm. And then in an office around the corner, that's where the catwalk was set up. So I'm like, there's something really compelling about this. I quite liked it. Um, So I went back to um, home and told my wife, and I said, this will be the smallest company I've ever worked for. Um, I'll have to take a bit of a pay cut. But do you know what? This is something really um, special that I'm getting from this. She said, if you want to give it a go and you'll be happy, go do it. So I did. Uh, I met the founder. We had a fantastic first meeting. Uh, And then he asked me to come back for a final interview. And the final interview was at the pub in Camden. And at 11.30, when um, I left the pub and we had dinner, I said, that was the longest interview I've ever had. Have I got the job yet? Because I can't cope with another interview like that. (laughs) And he said, I'll let you know in the morning. And that was it. And then I started in 2009. Hmm. Which pub was it in Camden? York and Albany. Okay. Do you know I know it, it well. Yeah, yeah, I know Camden very well. We had an awful lot of very important discussions in that pub. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's 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 a, it's not even a gastro pub. It's like a proper restaurant. So yeah, it's not it called is. like a pub in Camden. Yeah. Okay. It's a yeah. Po- it's a posh pub. Posh pub slash restaurant. So you started as a CFO. How did you make the transition from CFO to CEO? So the, when I joined, um, the founder, Nick, uh, was going, right, you look after this, which was CFO. Uh, and then he went, I think you can do logistics. Why don't you have logistics? So Nick was quite happy for me to run all the, uh, all the execution areas. And I'd had some experience of that at uh, Matalan. So I'd, I'd, had, I'd done IT at Matalan. I'd done some distribution work. On, um, so I became business change director. So I went, fine. Um, And so um, I ended up running um, uh, distribution, which was fulfillment and to um, to consumers. Uh, And so it became natural that I was almost operator and finance guy. And then I ended up picking up technology as well. So the only things I wasn't running um, until Nick and I made the switch was product and marketing and people. Um, so um, the, by the time um, Nick and I did the switch from um, where he formally stepped down and I became CEO, uh, I felt like I was running big chunks of the organisation. Um, and how did I do it? It was I focused on, uh, on the learnings I had when I was uh, first an IT director, uh, when I didn't know anything about IT. I asked a lot of questions, put a lot of challenges in, listened, 
ask them the same three questions. What's the benefit of that? Why should we do it? Where's the final strategy? What's it do for our customer? And then I spent an awful lot of time walking around warehouses, going through technology, just went deep and made sure I understood what the people were telling me um, meant. Mm. In which way your finance background was an advantage to you then? Because one of the key aspects of finance is analytical discipline. Um, one of the key aspects of becoming a great leader is curiosity. And so be curious, use analytical discipline. And I actually went, if I'm curious, I sit, listen and analyse, I'll be able to figure out what, um, what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And I need to also spend a lot of time standing in their shoes. So learning all the way back from Atalan, where I hadn't stood in the shoes of the operating board, I stood in the shoes. So I went around the warehouses, I went deep in technology, I went through the architecture maps, I went and stood and picked and packed boxes. So I knew what it felt like and I knew what they were dealing with. Now, not suggesting I was an operator, anything like as good as them, but I understand what they were trying to do and why they were trying to do it. Mm. And in which way having a finance background was a disadvantage to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I suppose people uh, uh, looked at me as the numbers guy rather than um, a solutions guy. So, but after a period of time, they saw how I, um, how I de de deployed myself, saw I was standing in their shoes, that went. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've dealt with a lot of people within finance. What do you think made you different? Um, that's a really good question. The, first of all, there was, um, I never grew up wanting to be an accountant. I went, I went into it going, I can do it. Um, I loved the way it trained my brain. And I was generally curious and interested in how businesses work. Um, I got real love of um, trying to figure out what consumers were doing. And I just followed that. And so when I was CFO, I made sure the back-end numbers were tight, but I actually put myself into the organisation as best I can alongside the operators so I could help them shape decisions before they actually hit the P&L account, hit the cash flow or hit the balance sheet. So it became a natural flip. So I would say curiosity, analytical discipline, listening um, and then challenging were key aspects that uh, I used. What was Nick Robertson, the founder of ASOS, like to work with? Um, Super inspirational guy. Uh, he and I were good mates um, and very focused on his mission, very focused on customer experience. Um, he had a couple of phrases that stay with me, like never be afraid to turn left when others turn right. You know, a classic entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so very inspirational, built a great um, business that I was lucky to be part of. Mm. That's a great thing. Like never be afraid of looking... Turning going there. left when everyone's going right. Yeah. So can you give me an example of what that happened? Yeah, sure. Um, so we did it all the time. I, wo I wove this into the core values. So uh, when I did take over, I had to, um, because the scale had gone, so Nick left when the turnover was about 800 million or went onto the board. Uh, I then became CEO. Uh, when I left, um, the turnover was 4 billion. And we'd gone from 200 people to about 3,500 in London and 10,000 globally in various warehouses, US, Berlin and Barnsley. Uh, we had to make some of the, as you get bigger, you have to make some of these um, principles more embedded. So I wrapped them up in values. Uh, and he's told lots of stories about uh, never be afraid to turn left when others turn right. And I then go, because if it doesn't work out, you go the other, you, know, you, you go back the other way. But if it does work out and you find something interesting, follow it. Um, and so the values became be, always be authentic, brave, creative, and disciplined. So authentic was, I've just hired you for your passion, your talent, and enthusiasm. That's what I want you to bring to work. But bring your best self, because the brand deserves it, the customer deserves it, your team deserves it. Be brave. And your bravery was always um, never be afraid to, um, to turn left when others turn right, because you might find something interesting. I'll give an example in a second. And then the other one was creative, um, is be creative in whatever you do, whether it's in finance, design, product, marketing, because actually, um, you know, we're only here selling clothes. So let's be creative and have fun with what you're doing. And then the last one I added a few years later was D for discipline. Whatever it is you do, be disciplined about it. Hone your craft. Right, so um, this is not death by PowerPoint. This is not death by um, by KPIs. This is honing your craft to become good at whatever it is you do, and so that was the value framework.
And then I told a number of stories behind it. And here's a great one, is ASOS was famous for selling clothes. But one of the key stories um, was the chameleon foam. And so in, um, I think it was early 2004, ASOS had uh, run out of money or was close to running out of money. So Nick, the founder, sold his car to pay the staff payroll. Fortunately, there wasn't many um, staff around because the uh, on his own admission, it wasn't the best car. But he sold the car to pay the staff payroll. And always the cash, um, the cash flow is tightest in retail around two points in the year before Christmas and before Easter. So this was October time. Uh, we then went and um, bought a chameleon foam. And the chameleon foam is a chameleon. It's a pretty average foam. But what it does do is play a really cool catchy tune called Karma, 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 Chameleon. Mm. <laughs> and so that uh, is nothing to do with fashion, but it was everything to do about keeping ASOS alive. It was the best seller that Christmas. Cash flow crisis avoided move on um so there's an example of trying something uh, that actually worked out that was technically off mission but on the way to uh, building a unicorn business that asos became so there's a good example mm-hmm. um and cash flow crisis avoided we moved on now many years later when we celebrate our 15th um, uh, um anniversary we we went and got a couple of chameleon phones and we bought them off eBay. They're now vintage, so they're way more expensive. And we had them in the boardroom. Uh, we also told um, staff all about um, that, because it's all about the legacy. Nothing about what we do, but everything about how we got here. And we called one of our boardrooms the chameleon room. So mental signals, mental triggers of all the things that, we, that you should think about entrepreneurialism. Never be afraid to turn left when others turn right. Mm-hmm. So all of those things were woven into how we inducted staff how we dealt with our teams and how we symbolized it mm-hmm. i mean you grew the business from 200 million to 4 billion you said yeah that's an amazing achievement yeah i loved it what do you think has been the main reason for this success um asos were bloody good um and we had an amazing team who was super passionate about what they were doing we, without, um, without using um, phrases that others use, we were being super disruptive. We were focused on uh, winning. We were focused on building an amazing fashion destination. And it was an energy that was palpable. And lots of the things we did was just set our teams free. Um, and it was, yeah, give that one a go. Okay, give that one a go. Yeah. I mean, another example, when I was C- uh, CEO, is um, one of the design team uh, and the women's wear buyer came up to me and said, Nick, we want to do some wedding dresses. I oh, no, no, we can't do wedding dresses. I said, yeah, we can. I said, you're not going to give um, this, um, our customers, uh, hopefully best day of their life, um, a, way, you know, being a, dr- a wedding dress in a plastic bag. No, 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 we're not going to do that. I went, well, let's not do it then. He said, no, no, we are. Come and see it. So I went downstairs into the product room with them, um, and the product was amazing. Um, Now, it's not my best game, um, but I did go, wow. The prices were compelling, and they said, look, Nick, we can get a bride done, dusted, dress, garter, underwear, shoes, handbag, £400. I went, amazing. Okay, how are you going to pack it? Showed me how they were going to pack it in a box that fitted into um, uh, the ASOS white noise bag set up a separate line in the warehouse. They'd done all the work. The only thing I had to say was, go do it. Mm. Uh, And I went, you thought about it, girls. Go do it. So they basically just off their own backs, they were like, okay, we're going to come up with this concept, this idea, and we're just going to sell it to you. Because we encouraged them to do that, right? So we were building uh, capability, encouraging them to think differently, embedded in everything that Nick had started and then codified in our values. And yet in the following season, we sold 9,000 wedding dresses. Wow. And I got loads of um, notes sent to me from, uh, because it's on next day delivery, right? Sometimes you have to get married in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got loads of letters from uh, couples going, um, thank you very much, did X, Y, and Z, 
Um, my dress did turn up and I went on ASOS and it came the following day. It was brilliant. So I'm never going to shop with the other people again. Mm. And I had to get married in a hurry and this was perfect. So I've got loads of those things. Mm. Like you saved the day. We say so save the day. Mm, amazing. So that was the vibe. And you know, we were lucky to attract many talented people in all functions. Mm. Talking about successes, let's look at some of the things that went less well. What has been your biggest failure there? Uh, ASOS. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably left too early um, and I regret that I didn't f- um, finish my natural term um, and I should have done. Mm-hmm. Um, Why did you leave? Um, we just had a difference of opinion with the with the board. Some of it was me, some of it was them um, and sometimes um, you need a more considered approach but if you get hot-headed and emotional about something and I was super emotional about ASOS because I was in love with it um, I probably wasn't thinking as clearly as I should be. So I could have, um, that was one, that's one regret. Um, in terms of, um, there were, there were, I didn't categorize anything we did at ASOS as a failure. Um, I categorized it as a learning and to go, right, we've learned from that, let's go again. Um, and I, use words for the organization a lot like that's just a bump on the road right we've learned that let's not do that again or let's get get better so i didn't turn around and say that's a failure i didn't use phrases like fail fast fail forward but we thought that way so every time someone didn't work out just said bump on the road guys go again um so i don't think there were any uh, i can't think of any big failures um during that time we learn we use them as learning experiences And if you're going to use those phrases, you have to behave like that as a leader. So you therefore, if there's something that's not gone well, you don't lose your cool or um, get uh, get emotional with your team. Uh, You have to be the coolest person in the room. And when you say it's a bump on the road, what have we learned? Let's go again. You have to behave and mean that. Otherwise, you shut down something. So that was how um, I tried to be. Now, that was my learning to get there. But it was, that's how I tried to be. Mm. On that point of, you know, when things are not going well and you are the role model for the rest of the team, like you have to be the one bringing your best self forward so other people kind of model that on you. How did you feel being that role model? Uh, so that, was, that wasn't a natural place for me to be. Um, so, I mean, I loved being the CFO. I loved being the CFO alongside Nick. Because Nick can do all the jazz hands, and I could just make sure the execution was happening. And when there was um, when there's bumps on the road, Nick could soak, soak them up, and I'd be supportive. That was great. So when I became that person, it was like, okay, um, this is what it now feels like being a CEO. Um, because uh, when there are things going uh, not going according to plan, the organisation then looks at you, and go, what do we do? Um, and that wasn't something I was comfortable with until I went, I've got to be comfortable with it. So I went back to the points I've just said, be cool, be supportive, encourage, um, yes, be challenging, but go, we've got to do better, and ask. Don't pretend you know. If you pretend you know, you'll get it wrong. It's not the time to turn around and say, we should have done this. It's the time to go, what have we learned from this, guys? How do we get better? And the questions are subtly different. But when you ask like that, you, uh, you find people come to you with solutions rather than problems. If you tell, you build an execution muscle and a tell and do muscle, not a um, stronger muscle. That was how I pivoted. Now, that takes a lot to do that. And there's a bit where you have to be, therefore, comfortable being a bit vulnerable, going oh my God, guys, what do we do now? And sometimes I found that's the best thing you can do as a leader um, because you you haven't been chosen to be CEO because you're the smartest uh, or you've got all the answers. And if you think that, you'll get it wrong um, or you might get it wrong. Um, You've been chosen for something else. And so being comfortable expressing your own vulnerability and asking those questions, you will find people bring you answers. Mm. And then your job is to choose. Make the decision. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you're saying that because absolutely you can't have all the answers as a CEO. Impossible. Because what's the point of having the team? Uh, Correct. 
And so, I mean, looking back, I've found some phrases that um, I've picked along the ways. You can never be a leader without followers, right? And so, and if you haven't got followers, you'll fail as a leader. And so how do you create followership? Well, you have to therefore have some basic humanity, um, and which is, uh, for basic humanity is, you've got to trust some people, and they've got to trust you. And you've got to know they've got your back. They've got to know that um, um, you've got their back. And then you've created a safe place where they can share their worries, their concerns, and their solutions. And you have to have a place where bad news can travel faster than good news. Good news finds its way anyway. Bad news tends to get stuck. And it gets stuck because people are are scared of sharing it. Now, I used to talk about that all the time because I'm going, look, I'd like to hear the bad news um, a lot quicker because I might be able to help you. If I can't help you, I can at least unburden you Mm -hmm. and you'll feel less worried and we've got a chance of moving on faster. So you've got to create that um, that followership or she's not a leader and a CEO is only as good as his team or her team and you've got to create that psychological safety where people can come to you and you've got to be, you've got to bring your own humanity into it rather than anything else. And then you build a muscle with people that scales, then you build a muscle that grows, and then you build a muscle that gets better. And nothing is perfect. Life is not a game of perfect, neither is business. You are gonna have, you are gonna drop the ball. Uh, but every time you drop the ball, don't yell, go, right, what do we do differently? And then you get learning as well. Mm. What do your followers say behind your back about you? you? (laughs) They'll probably tell you more than me, Maria. Um, (laughs) I hope they go, um, Nick Bacters, Nick Trusteders, um, and Nick shaped um, the organisation in a way that I wanted to be part of it. I hope they say that. Um, They won't all like me. Um, because sometimes leadership isn't a popularity contest. It's not about winning uh, an election here. Um, but I do hope they'd say, I respect the decisions you made and why you made them, even if they weren't what I wanted. So it's respect is probably the most, um, the most thing I'd wish they'd say, or I'd like, they'd like them to say, and understanding why I did it. So if I did any decision I made, I would normally explain why I'd done it. And so even if you wanted something, me to do something, Maria, that I didn't agree with you, I'd tell you why I had not done it. You might not like it, but you'd understand. And I've given you the time to explain. Mm. You've felt that you've left ASOS too early. Yeah. And how did the role at Matches come about? So post ASOS, I was um, going to do plural. Um, And um, I want to do plural because... I didn't think I'd find another exec role where I had the same passion for it. And I didn't want to then do an exec role when I was always comparing to what I did at ASOS. And I'd be comparing the people, the feeling, the emotion, what we were doing, how we were growing. And I went, I didn't think I can cope with that comparison. And so um, I'd, let's go and do something plural. And um, I sort of lined up a few things where I was going to do that. And during, during that period uh, post-ASOS, I uh, did a couple of meetings with the uh, APAX, the private equity partner who were involved, um, and they're asking me a few questions. I was doing a little bit of advisory work for them and some others, and they said, we'd like to have a look at matches. And so I did. I gave them my view, um, and um, they said, we'd like to run it. I said, I don't think it's for me. And they said, we'd really like to run it. And so I went, well, if you do this, and, um, and you put this level of investment in, um, then I'll give it a go. Um, and I got curious. Um, I wanted it to be saved because it's a British retailer. Um, it was everything in there was in my wheelhouse apart from dealing with luxury. Uh, and that was you know, exciting um, too. And I went, this is a British retailer with a great heritage started by two uh, British founders. I want this to be turned around. And I want it to be saved. It needed saving. And that's why I ended up going, let's do it. Uh, I knew there was um, there was upsides and downsides, um, but I totally backed myself to give it a go. Didn't work out, but I totally gave it a go. Mm. So what went wrong at Matches? Uh, what went wrong was, um, was, well, let me start with what went right. Um, so 
we um, we found a number of um, cultural aspects that needed fixing because it had five CEOs in about as many years. So when a company um, ends up being run like Chelsea Football Club, you never end up getting uh, strategies, culture, ways of working that stick. So uh, the previous CEOs were changed too frequently and therefore whether they were all right or wrong, it doesn't matter. If they were changed within a year, none of the strategies or changes were enabled to be embedded. So we need some fixing there. So it needed a cultural reboot. It needed new mission, purpose, and values. So we put that in there. So this is why we're here. That's the purpose. This is where we go as a mission. And this is how we'll do it, which is the values. Uh, it then needed a crunchy business plan and strategy behind it, which is what we were put in place. And then it needed new life breathing into the management team. So... I ended up changing all the management team um, and then um, deployed a new management team. Um, we then went, there's some things that are wrong. The curation wasn't a curation. It was too broad. It was a splattering of product rather than a really focused edit that was unbelievable. So I went, right, we need to do that. Um, there was way too many uh, dresses, um, going out dresses um, and shoes. I'm like... Uh, our woman customer is not just going to wear uh, expensive dresses and high heels. She's going to hang out in casual wear. She's going to want some lounge wear. She's going to want some active wear. So we've got to give her a ultimate edit of luxury product that suits her lifestyle. She's not just going to be wearing posh frocks and high heels every day. And our balance is wrong. So we did that. We cut an awful lot of the brands to make it more focused, um, which is a hard decision, but it makes it more focused. Uh, we had to remove a number of staff because it was too, there's too many, broadly 250. Uh, we had to relearn digital marketing, relearn merchandising, refocus the organization on contribution, refocus on making money. We'd half the losses um, in year one, so I was only there 14 months. Um, and unfortunately, Apex um, didn't want to follow on any further investment. They'd indicated they'll give um, X, they put initial half X in. Uh, when we went back for the following, they said, the market's changed, we don't want to follow on. Which was a real shame, um, because we were starting to make traction. There's a number of deals going. But it had been loss-making for four or five years. Then we got into the hands of uh, Mike Ashley through an accelerated um, sale process, and Mike Ashley did what Mike Ashley does, and that was the end of matters. Now, didn't need to go into administration. Um, it could have been turned around, it could have been saved. But it did need more investment. And so if Apex weren't prepared to put the investment in, Mike Ashley certainly uh, wasn't, um, there were very other places where we could do it. You need capital to do a turnaround to give you the we we a breathing space to make the changes. Do you think it's also timing? I mean, obviously, given what we've been, all the aftermath after COVID and investors being very, very tight with money do you think that played a part yeah 100 mm -hmm. so the macro environment was also really tough right so luxury had been growing um you know by um substantially for seven years um and it'd been growing not by volume predominantly by price increases so for five six seven years luxury sales were up but prices were up by about average five percent per annum um and so the macro environment wasn't, um, hasn't been great for 12, 18 months in the consumer market. Luxury started, suddenly started to hit the buffers around about July, August last year. And we saw, um, we saw uh, bad news with Farfetch, Netta Porter getting into trouble. And our investment decision with Matches was at a similar time of all of that. So I don't blame Apex for their decision. I wish they hadn't have done it. Um, but I can see the context in the marketplace would have been part of the decision making. Hmm. What do you think everyone in e-commerce needs to know about e-commerce? Right. So first of all, um, on the e-commerce market, there's a four year period um, during COVID and post COVID you need to eliminate from your uh, thinking. So the two years of COVID was just a, a super boost in e -com that you'll never get again. Um, the two and a bit years after of just being the, the pullback. Now, if you draw a straight line from 2019 and the trend, um, the trend previously, you'll find 2024 e-commerce penetration is exactly on the line that we all expected without this blip. Now, <coughs> what's happened is post-COVID, we all expected, me included, 
is the pullback to be small, um, not to be as dramatic as what has happened. So it's gone like that and like that. And so um, you have this boost and then you have this pullback. But the straight line trend is e-commerce is probably on the same trajectory as it would have been without the pandemic. So will e-com um, therefore continue to grow as a channel? 100%. Right, so the Gen Z, the millennial consumers who've only ever shopped on their mobile phone and digital will love experiencing stalls, but they'll love experiencing and continue to experience far more on their smartphones in the way that they always have been. Now, that consumer is getting more economic power and will ripple through. So you have to build a very strong e-commerce offer. You have to build um, stores if you want to. The best model is stores, is e-com, and with some wholesale. That's the best model. And so you have to have a strong e-com offer to future-proof your organization for the next wave of customers. It's just we've been, with the data has been skewed by the boost of COVID and the pullback of COVID. Now, what do you need to know to be, um, uh, to be successful in e-com? Focus on the customer. The, the concepts are very similar. You've got to be great in, uh, you've got to run the front end beautifully and run the back end like you're running a, su- uh, a supermarket. And because the, the margins are lower, um, but and so you've got to be super tight on it. Conversion is the eighth wonder of the world. Focus on conversion. Get great at digital marketing. Great, uh, get good at moving product around. Great, get good at uh, building a product offer that drives a strong uh, conversion and strong unit economics. And it'll be different for whether you sell um, cheap clothing or uh, value clothing or luxury clothing. It's the same concept. Build the front end that's beautiful social media, smartphones, apps, and then the back end run it really efficiently. But that's very similar to a, um, a normal retail business. So it's very similar, just different application. Mm. So given what you're talking about, COVID, having this sort of you know, extreme down and followed by extreme up and sort of another blip, what do you think is the future of e-commerce i mean you're talking about that it's back to where it was had it just continued without this period of time what do you think is the future of it so i can see in fashion that 50 percent of people's spend will be through an e-com channel in the next period the next cycle i don't know when but it will be so in 2019 30 percent of all clothing um, nearly in the uk was bought online now, obviously, during the pandemic, that went up to high 90s, and it's come back down again. So I see 50% of it quite easily in reach. Interesting. And so, therefore, if you haven't built an e-com offer that's capable of receiving 50% of your customer's spend, mm. you've left yourself exposed. There's something you said earlier about when you were at Matalan and you were too focused on the long term, but not focusing on the short term, at least at that point in time. Is there something to do with that as well? Because, I mean, obviously you have to react to what's happening in the here and now, but keeping the long term vision in mind. And it's almost like this ability to manage polar opposites that you that makes you successful. Like you can't focus too much on one or the other. Yeah, so you could say that's spinning different plates, um, and or you could say um, manage for today while building for tomorrow, and make sure because today's context might be very different, and so if the economic um, position you're in means you can't invest in the things for uh, tomorrow, keep today alive to keep your powder dry to then do that. So you always have to manage today and tomorrow. So manage today while building for tomorrow, but be clear when you need to start switching or pivoting. What advice would you give aspiring CEOs? Um, So the, um, you don't get picked to be CEO necessarily because you're the best um, at your executional or functional discipline. You get picked because somebody thinks you can add something different. Um, And so a CEO, when you first appointed, can do one of two things. You can run around every part of the organization and get stuck in all the detail and think you're helping. Or you can step back and go, um, I've got to now exercise the muscle that someone has seen in me uh, and build myself as a leader. And so I've seen, I've done both, uh, and I've seen people do both. 
if you start running around and being in part of being involved in all the detail and and you're effectively lost in transition and if you're lost in transition you're not really helping your team and you're not really doing the things that the, the people who have chosen you um, um, want you to do and you find yourself being the busiest person um, um, in the organization and but you find yourself not really making cut through on anything a CEO there's probably six to a dozen key decisions that you have to make every year tops and they're the old ones that only you can make the rest of the decisions should be made by your team and you should enable them to be made by the team yes monitor yes be on top of the detail but make sure uh, you're making the right calls and they're making the right calls otherwise you're following each other around so my, that's my first advice is make sure you've decided how you're going to um, deploy yourself and I think um, my experience is the 6 to 12 maximum decisions only you have to make and give yourself the time to do it if you're following your team around you're not doing what they want you to do and need you to do and you're shit in their way if the team aren't right change the team and get people who want to be on your mission hire for aptitude as well as experience um, which is how you were hired and you don't always think about it that way set up a clear purpose clear mission clear values which only you can do you do with the team and then you galvanize people towards it so yes uh, you should be involved in monitoring execution but execution is the responsibility of your functional directors you are ultimately accountable so be on top of it but let them do it mm -hmm. so those are the those are the things i found um, and then the other bit is be present um, in all the places you need to be present. Use every opportunity to shape um, the organisation. Don't be afraid to repeat yourself. Um, and repeating yourself is going, guys, this is what we're about. Here's our mission. This is how we do it. Because it's reinforcing key messages that's super useful. And um, so don't be afraid to repeat yourself. Don't be afraid to make the tough calls. And they'll respect you. Um, when there are tough moments, don't go invisible. Don't go into the boardroom um, and, and surround yourself by PowerPoint. Be present. Walk the floor more. Do all hands. Be present at the uh, weekly team meetings because they will notice and people will come and respond to whatever um, messages you're giving. So be present. Always be present. Don't retreat when there's tough moments. Um, and you know, build your team. Trust your team. And then use mechanisms. Um, so um, mechanisms I always use is, and I learned them, is no more than six to eight direct reports, right? Because you'll never create the humanity and the trust if you've got 14. You'll let down 14 people rather than really working for six to eight people. And when you build six to eight um, direct reports, know something about them, they know something about you. They trust you, therefore, you trust them. And that means you'll know the partner's name, you know the children's name, you'll know when uh, they've got significant birthdays going on, and give a bit of you too. You've built a piece of trust, and that person will therefore run with you, run for you, and feel like you've got her back, and vice versa. That's really important. And if the persons, the people are wrong in the team, you're going to have to change them. Um, and the first time someone ever said that to me, I absolutely hated it when they said you're gonna to have to fire a few people to um to enable people to take you seriously and i just thought what a complete and utter piece just of to fire people just because rather than having a reason to do that yeah interesting yeah uh well that's how i interpreted it and i thought mm. that was the worst advice i ever heard <laughs> um but, and i went that's completely uh, against um everything i stand for but actually sometimes i think he didn't mean it the guy didn't mean it the way it came across it was you're going to have to build your own team and you're going to have to therefore remove some and add some to get the shape of the team right, which is for the benefit of the organisation. So it, it sounds brutal, but actually it's it became something that I went, hmm. So it wasn't a just because, it was because you now need to shape the team in your flavour rather than expecting the same things in the same construct with the same players. Mm. That's interesting. So you're a new CEO, you're going into a business. How do you decide who to replace? So I 
read a book years ago called The First 100 Days. And every new leader, I always give them the first 100 days. And one of them is talking about categorising the capability of the team you're working with. And so you categorise them into capable and disaffected, capable and, um, and engaged. And I then try and assess where they sit in that. And once I've assessed where I've sit in that, I know what I've got, I know what I'm dealing with. And I, I've not always done this well. You then go, I need a blend of people that fill in my gaps, uh, some that um, uh, augment my strengths, and some who are going to think differently and be a bit maverick. Um, because you've then got a blend of interesting perspective rather than, I'm going to hire six people that look like Nick, think like Nick, and behave like Nick, because wouldn't that be dull? So um, I want a, um, so it's cognitive diversity, it's skills diversity, it's different ways of thinking and behaving, because within that you get a cocktail of better ideas, and your role is therefore to bring them together as a team, navigate them the team, and then choose the right or wrong um, direction for them. Mm. And if you get super talented people like that that are high energy highly engaged it's quite tough it's also quite fun mm. how do you avoid hiring clones uh actively choose not to mm. so you have to be very consciously aware yeah so early in my leadership you end up hiring people who you think you get on with that's quite important but not the most important do you think that it's also imp it's actually more important when the teams are smaller and the business is smaller and as the business grows it becomes something that you have to be almost moving away from no i think it's really important at all scale of organization and so how we ended up at the last couple of uh, teams i built um, i started to build mechanisms for testing my judgment so um, I built, um, we used personality profiling, we used um, some specific ASOS values tests. Um, I made sure all the top team spent two hours with an educational psychologist and I got the output from all of those. So that gave me cumulative assurance that my judgments and assessments of the individual were supported by some sort of evidence. And um, whether it made it better or not, I don't know. I felt like I was making better decisions on the back of it because I got some cumulative um, evidence to help me go, this is the right person. I think it's important to have the intention and, as you said, looking for evidence. Whatever the structure is that you are asking yourself those questions and looking for that evidence rather than making assumptions. Correct. It's really easy to go, oh, this lady's fantastic, we're going to get on great, she's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And then you stop, um, you stop um, searching for the evidence to support it because you've already made your decision. Mm -hmm. So that's why I fight myself and go, right, now let me go through the process. Mm -hmm. Let me pause and reflect. And my first um, judgments might be right, and if they are brilliant, but let me put through the process to make sure I'm absolutely cool. Mm -hmm. And then you bring colleagues in to get a validation so I always bring colleagues in to get a validation. Has there been a moment where maybe early on, because it seems that you have figured this out, that you have really liked someone and thought, I'd really get on with them, so let's just go for it, let's hire them. And yes, then I've it went that. wrong. Yeah, I've done that. What happened? Uh, it went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, How wrong? Um, and people decisions like that, I mean, some of my, back to my earlier question, some of my biggest mistakes... Um, at ASOS, we're all about people decisions, and it's choosing the wrong the wrong person that I thought was right, and then not choosing to react to that when I should have done. Those are my worst mistakes because um, they tend to leave landmines that blow up. They tend to leave bruises that aren't great. You think they're operating under the values and approach um, that you um, have discussed with them and you find out later that they're not and it tends to unsettle the organisation, the execution and isn't cool. So it's, it's one of those where I would say those have been my things I wish I'd have done, acted faster when I got it wrong. Mm. I'd, still take a, I'd still take a 
um, I'd still take a decision on someone if I thought, yeah, he or she's going to be great. But if I've got it wrong, I need to move faster. And it's quite interesting because you it takes a bit of time for you to realise you've made a mistake because you want them to work out because you're involved in it. Then you end up looking for supportive information to prove that you're right. And you might not listen to some of the feedback from the team because what you see is great. Uh, and that, that passage of time is quite potentially damaging. So, Confirmation bias. Yes. Mm-hmm. I've chosen this person and therefore I'm right. And so you look for things, support that you're right, even though when it's going wrong. Mm, like you don't look for evidence against your decision. And it doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean not capable people. It just means the construct, the circumstance, the environment isn't right for them. Yeah. And so it's your role, unfortunately, as a leader to act upon that. Mm. What's the saying? High, slow, fire, fast. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you asked me earlier about biggest mistakes. I forgot to tell you that. Those will be my biggest mistakes. Mm. Not do, not following that, um, that advice. It's pretty much every CEO I speak to, that's one of their biggest failures they say it's like not firing people soon enough yeah you 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 tend to know here in your gut before you've processed it in your mind Mm. and your mind overrules your gut for too long interesting i actually think it's a bit of both it's like knowing how to separate and work with both because the gut is obviously telling you something based on your experience, but your gut can also fool you into thinking that you need to look for evidence for it. Because you'd yeah, also because too. the gut is like, well, I'm usually right, so why am I wrong in this instance? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like it's, it's, it can play against you as well. I agree. So I think it's being intentional, but also learning to listen to your instincts, but knowing when to question your instincts as well. Totally agree. Because when the two are in sync, then you're like, I know now and I know why this isn't working. And then there's, there's another bit that I do a lot of is I will, um, I will take someone and, and, and let them ha- um, on and choose someone and give them allowable weaknesses as long as those allowable weaknesses are within something that's important to me or not important to me. And so, and that's the bit where I go... I'll give them room to grow on that. That's important too. Give them room to grow. Yeah. Because we've all got weaknesses, right? And people can surprise you. 100%. Mm. And given the right environment, people can really like level up and step up into their potential and learn and change and grow. But if, and this is where you're talking about giving that space, you can't do that when you don't have space. There's something magical about um, backing someone letting them know they're backed, telling them where, um, where they could be even better, and then watching them be even better. Mm. There's something really rewarding and magical about it for both. Mm. And so that's one of the beauties of being in a leadership role. You can have those moments. So um, I like those moments. You had experience of that early on for yourself. Yeah. You've seen how that yeah. can make a massive difference to yep. your life. Totally. Early on with, um, with a guy who said, come and try this, early on with um, uh, with other circumstances. So it definitely is something I'll enjoy because I definitely was someone that benefited by someone believing. Mm. It's interesting that the, the thread through your career is this ability to pivot and evolve and step into a role. So, for example, going from, you know, not knowing what you're doing, it's like, okay, accounting, then going into KPMG and then going into a retailer and then from retailer going into an e-coms business. So having and going from a, you know, finance to then CEO. So they're quite big transitions uh, with regards to having to grow into something or, or change. It's almost like, like many reinventions. Yeah. Great. Mm. So the, I mean, my phrase, if you ask me is we're forever work in progress and one day I'll be a great leader. Until that day, I'll keep getting better. And uh, every time there's an opportunity to expand and grow and build new muscles, I tend to take it mm. and then try and back myself to um, make it happen. Um, and um, you know, learn, and listen from others around. Um, the those are the key things: is having the humility and awareness and the presence to go. This is one of those moments where I need to ask, learn rather than say and do. 
Hmm. So looking back now, what advice would you give your younger self? Don't worry, it all turned out fine. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be all right. You don't need to work so hard. <laughs> well, no, I would say I'd say still work hard, but I was. I'm joking. Yeah. It's because it's 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 such an interesting question because it's like that that whole concept of time travel. If you go back and change something, will your whole life turn out differently? So, had you told yourself that everything's going to be all right, would you have worked as hard as you did? That's a great question, Maria. I don't know <laughs> is the answer, but you find yourself. Um, when people ask you certain questions, you find yourself saying things that you think now that you, I know damn well I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's, you then have to go, yeah, I know I never did that, um, but the, it's one of those where do as I've now learnt rather than do as I did because you'll save yourself a lot of emotion, a lot of heartache, a lot of, um, a lot of angst. Um, so I would say go back uh, if I did go back and say don't worry um, it'll all work out fine I probably wouldn't have had the same focus and endeavour um, looking back I was probably quite a driven individual uh, I was quite pushy um, and I might not need to have been all of those um, characteristics but it might not have got me to where I got to so I don't know the answer mm. I do think about that question because the reason why I started thinking about it more. I interviewed Mark Curry, the co-founder of the Inky List. Yeah. And he said, well, I wouldn't say anything to myself. And if I did, I probably wouldn't have listened to it anyway. There's a bit and of I, that. And I thought, actually, that's really interesting. Like, would you, there's some reason to live being unpredictable that you don't know what's going to happen. Because if you do, you would definitely make decisions in a different way. Yes, you would. And there's there's a number of sliding doors that are probably best to have gone through without the knowledge of what might happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's this idea like, had I done that? I was like, should I have be regretting this decision? Yeah, yeah no. I, so I don't know the answer to that. Mm-hmm. But I, I, there, there is one thing. I do, there's another thing that I do um, that I do reflect on and I reflect on in current in current some of the more, uh, current workforce is there's a bit of resilience that I think people can't be taught that you have to learn and then I worry I, I've wondered a lot about it so one of the aspects I think that makes people successful is not whether they're super visionary not whether they're great leaders not whether they're great functional experts i think they are all part of the ingredients and they're important but there's a little bit of resilience and the resilience is you're going to get knocked back a few times you're going to move sideways before you move up someone's going to not give you that pay rise quite often until you get the promotion and it's how you cope with those resili- those moments and you know there's there's many people where um you know, in my previous life where they've gone, well, I've been here six months now, so when am I going to be a manager? I'm like, well, you've, you've got quite a way to go. Well, why not a director? Well, you're going to have to be 10 years in post to become a director. Well, what does she do that I don't do? Well, it's quite a lot, actually. So, and then there's a bit, oh, I'm out then. So there's a bit of how you cope with that sort of journey as a person, as an individual. There's nothing wrong with being pushy, there's nothing wrong with asking. But there's the resilience needs um, aspects is that you're going to be knocked back way more than you're going to be, um, going to be promoted. Uh, you have to wait far longer than you really want to. And you're going to have far more bumps on the road than you really want to. So it's coping with those bumps on the road. They're the galvanizing moments. They're the things that shape you as a person, how you cope with the bumps and how you rise from the bumps, because you're going to have bumps. <laughs> and, for, and, and it's the same with an organisation. Every bump you go through as an organisation, it's how you um, galvanise the change from it. And as a person, it's exactly the same. Whatever the bump is, it's how you rise from it that ends up defining you and ends up defining an organisation. Mm-hmm. So there's something about resilience that I think is something I've talked a lot about with people I work with. Mm-hmm. Now, they look at me and just think, he would say that. But I actually think it's really important. So what's kept you going? What do you think has made you resilient? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so um, there's, various, there's, there's various moments. That when I qualified as a chartered accountant and passed the exams and got through that, there was a piece where I went, well, I'm now smart enough um, to 
um, figure things out and pass some pretty tough exams. I'm not the only one to do it. Plenty have done it and harder. But that gave me an awful lot of confidence that um, I'm going, I've now got the mental resilience and capability to figure things out. But that's only a part of the equation. Um, And then on the emotional aspects of resilience, I've developed a technique where I go, I catastrophize and look at the worst outcome and take me through that, uh, take myself through that outcome where it's visceral. And then I'm like, is that it? And so when I get to the place where, is that it? That if that's the worst thing that can happen, I then build myself back up from it and go, right, well, let's go for it. Because I now know what the worst thing that can happen is. It ain't that bad. Um, and so I'd like to avoid that. And then I then feel personally equipped to um, authentically say, we're going to do this team. Because mm-hmm. I've envisaged it, it ain't that bad. And there are very few things that really are that bad. Now, out in business, there's other things that... Um, that, that can be but when you catastrophize it and then bring it back to the present and go okay I feel empowered to go for this I can equip, I've equipped myself that's the technique I do so but you know this I read someone um, someone's article the other day uh, about resilience and it was a CEO of an American tech firm and he said something like um, the only way I can um, um, advise you on being resilient is to endure suffering so if you endure suffering, um, you'll be resilient. So in the kindest possible way, I wish you all suffering. <laughs> Something like that is what he said, mm-hmm. which I thought was really interesting. And um, because it's one of those things where resilience comes with just judgment, experience, wisdom, and experiencing it, and then how you cope with it. And then you go, I went through that, and I'm still here. It's all fine. We can go again. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting um aspect and I, think I think it's important life, in it's very hard to avoid suffering and I think our problems actually stem from trying to distance ourselves from it and from like shutting it off rather than just going through it um, that's what I've experienced like the more you don't deal with the difficult things the harder it is to move forward 100% yeah. they, be, they become it's a bit like you know as I was saying earlier what are the things I'm carrying that I need to let go of because they're holding me back? So let's get rid of those. What are the things I need to carry forward? Let's carry them forward. And then I'm sh- I've am shedded that bit and I go again. Mm. Well, you read the book called Great by Choice. No. Nope. Jim Collins. And... No, I've read lots of Jim Collins, not yeah. that one. Good so, to Great is one and Built to Last is another. Yeah. So in Great by Choice, he talks about sort of 10 exits. So companies that have outperformed by at least 10 times the market yep. um, and the different qualities they all had. And one of the things he talks about is, well, discipline. So this idea, he calls it like the 20 mile march. So no matter what the weather, you still do 20 miles a day. You don't need to go more than that but even if it's like it's really stormy outside you still kind of like do it so this idea of building yourself up to perform at a certain optimal level regardless of the conditions and not overstretching yourself on the good days either Um, the other thing he talks about is um, this idea of not going below the death line and this is what you're talking about doing almost this sort of pre-mortem of like what all of the things can go wrong yeah and figuring out um all of the potential things that might happen that are not so great and coming up with um solutions for them and then thinking okay you know what we know if this happens and this happens we already have an idea of how to respond to We've it, got it covered. should that happen. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, so this, what does he call it? Productive paranoia. Yep. And, yep. Um, I did follow that. And so, so yeah, no, it's a book that could probably be an article, <laughs> but the concepts that he talks about in it are really interesting. You talked about having sort of this portfolio career i mean there's a lot of things that we haven't covered i mean you're on the board of several companies is that what you envisage continuing doing is that your future that's a good question so i really enjoy um the um the companies i'm on the board of and advise of i really enjoy it um because i like working with the the mostly founder led um and you're on youngish entrepreneurs and i love it um they because they uh, they want advice 
um, there's things they haven't yet um, experienced or uh, mistakes they haven't yet made. And I go, no, no, don't try that one. Try that one. That's a great idea. Give it a go. So that's really good fun. Um, but I think I'm, I think I'm, I'm currently in the moment where I think I want to be another CEO, but I'm not sure whether I do. So I'm kind of going, uh, I think I want to um, run another organization because I love building teams. I love galvanizing change. I love getting stuff done. But actually, um, I'm at a moment where I might just take a couple more uh, non-exec style roles, advisory roles. So I'm currently figuring it out. So that's what my summer's about, trying to figure out where I want to go and see what's coming. So that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. Hmm. Well, I wish you all the best. Actually, before we go, if you were to describe what leadership means to you in three words, what is that? Be purpose-driven, be mission-led, be guided by values and live by them. Thank you, Nick. Really appreciate you coming on the show. I've enjoyed it, Maria. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky.